The Dream of Duncan Perrinesse by Rudyard Kipling. Like Mr. Bunyan of old, I, Duncan Perrinesse, writer to the most honorable, the East Indian Company, in this godforsaken, forgotten city of Calcutta, have dreamed a dream, and never since, since that kitty my mare fell lame have I been so troubled. Therefore, lest I should forget my dream, I have made shift to set it down here though heaven knows how unhandy the pen is to me who is always readier with the sword than inkhorn when I left London two long years since. When the Governor-General's great dance that he gives yearly at the latter end of November was finished, I had gone to mine own room, which looks over that sullen, un-English stream, the Hoogly, scarce so sober that I might have been, now, roaring drunk in the west is but fuddled in the east, and I was drunk nor nor easterly, as Mr. Shakespeare might have said. Yet, in spite of my liquor, the cool night winds, though I've heard that they bred chills and fluxes innumerable, sobered me somewhat, and I remembered that I had been but a little wrung and wasted by all the sickness of the past four months, whereas those young bloods that came eastward with me in the same ship had been all a month back, planted to eternity in the foul soil north of writer's building. So then, I thank God, God mistily, though to my shame I never kneeled down to do so, for license to live, at least till March should be upon us again. Indeed, that we were alive, and our number was less by far than those who had gone to their last account in the hot weather last past, late past, had made very merry that evening, by ramparts of the fort, over this kindness of providence, though our jests were neither witty nor such as I should have liked my mother to hear. When I had laid down, or rather thrown me down on my bed, and the fumes of my drink had a little cleared away, I found that I could get no sleep for thinking of a thousand things that were better left alone. First, it was a long time since I had thought of her, the sweet face of Kitty Somerset, drifted drifted as it might have been drawn in a picture across the foot of my bed so plainly that I almost thought she had been present in the body. Then I remembered how she drove me to this accursed country to get rich, that I might more quickly marry her, our parents on both sides giving their consent, and then how, how she thought better, or worse maybe, of her troth and wed Tom, Tom Sanderson but a short three months after I had sailed. From Kitty I felt amu fell amusing on Miss Mrs. Vandersteen, a tall, pale woman with violet eyes that had come to Calcutta from the Dutch factory at Chinsura, and had set all our young men, and not a few of the factors, by the ears. Some of our ladies, it is true, said that she had never, ha never a husband or marriage lines at all, but women, especially those who have led only indifferent good lives themselves, are cruel hard one on another, are cruel hard one on another. Beside, Miss Vanderthin was far prettier than them all. She had been most gracious to me at the governor, governor's route, and indeed I was looked upon by all as her pre, primux chevalier, which is a French for much worse word. Now, whether I cared so much as a scratch of a pin for this same Miss Van Suthian, albeit I had vowed eternal love three days after we met, I knew not then, nor did till later on, but mine own pride and a skill in the small sword that no man in Calcutta could equal kept me in her affections, so that I believed I worshipped her. When I had dis dismissed her violet eyes from my thoughts, my reason reproached me for ever having followed her at all, and I saw how the one year that I had lived in this land had so burnt and seared my mind with the flames of a thousand bad passions and desires, and that I had aged ten months for each one in the devil's school, whereat I thought of my mother for a while, and was very penitent, penitent making in my sinful, tipsy mood a thousand vows of reformation, all since broken, I fear, me, again and again. Tomorrow, says I to myself, I will live cleanly forever, and I smiled dizzily, the liquor still being being still strong in me, to think of the dangers I had escaped, and built all manner of fine castles in Spain, whereof a shadowy kitty Somerset 
that had the violet eyes and the sweet slow speech of Miss Van Suthian was always queen. Lastly, a very fine and magnificent courage that doubtless had its birth in Miss, Mrs. Mr. Hastings Madeira grew upon me till it seemed I could become governor general, nabob, prince, I, even the great Mongol him, Mughal himself, by the mere wishing of it. Wherefore, taking my first steps, random and unstable enough, towards my new kingdom, I kicked my servants, servants sleeping without till they howled and ran for me, and called heaven and earth to witness that I, Duncan Perroness, was a writer in the service of the company, and afraid of no man. Then, seeing that neither the moon nor the great bear were minded to accept my challenge, I lay down again, and must have fallen asleep." I was waked presently by my last words repeated two or three times, and I saw that there had come into the room a drunken man, as I thought, from Mr. Hastings' rout. He sat down at the foot of my bed in all the world as, as it belonged to him, and I took note, as well as I could, that his face was somewhat like mine, only own, mine own, grown older, save when it changed to the face of the Governor-General or my father, dead these six months." but this seemed to me only natural, and the due result of too much wine, and I was so angered at his entry, all unannounced, that I told him, not over-civilly, to go. To all my words he made no answer whatsoever, only saying slowly, as, the, as though it were some sweet morsel, writer in the company's service and afraid of no man. Then he shot, stops short, and, turning round sharp upon me, says that one of my kidneys need fear neither man nor devil, that I was a brave young man, and like enough should I live so long to be governor-general. But for all these things, and I suppose that he meant thereby the changes and chances of our shifty life in these parts, I must pay my price. By this time I had sobered somewhat, and being well waked out of my first sleep, was disposed to look upon the matter as a tipsy man's jest. So I says merrily, and what price shall I pay for this palace of mine, which is but twelve feet square, and my five poor pagodas a month. The devil take you in your jesting. I have paid my price twice over in sickness. At that moment, my man turns full towards me, so that by the moonlight I could see every line and wrinkle of his face. Then my drunken mirth died out of me, as I have seen the waters of our great rivers die away in one night, and I, Duncan Perinus, who was afraid of no man, was taken with more a deadly terror than I hold it has ever been the lot of mortal man to know. For I saw that his face was my very own, but marked and lined and scarred with furrows of disease and much evil living, as I once, when I was, Lord help me, very drunk indeed, have seen mine own face, all white and drawn and grown old in a mirror. I take it that any man who would have been even more greatly feared than I, for I am no way wanting in courage." After I had lain still for a little while, little, sweating in my agony and waiting until I should wake from this dreadful dream, terrible dream, for dream I knew it to be, he says again that I must pay my price, and that I'll, and a little after, as though it were to be given in pagodas and sika rupees, what price will you pay, says I, very softly, for God's sakes, let me be, whoever you are, and I will mend my ways from tonight." says he, laughing a little at my words, but otherwise making no motion of having heard them. Nay, I would only be rid of so brave a young ruffler as yourself, as much as much that will be a great hindrance to you on your way through life in the Indies. For, believe me, and here he looks full on me once more, there is no return. All this rigmarole, which I could not then understand, I was a good deal put aback and waited for or what should come next, says he very calmly, give me your trust in man. And at that I saw how heavily would be my price, for I never doubted that he would take from me all that he asked, and my head was, though through terror and wakefulness, altogether cleared of wine I had drunk. So I takes him up very short, crying that I was not so wholly bad as he would make believe, and that I trusted my fellows to the full as much as they were worthy of it. It was none of my fault, says I, if one of them were were liars, and the other half deserved to be burnt in the hand, and I would once more ask him to have done with his questions. Then I stopped, a little afraid, it is true, to have let my tongue so run away with me, but he took no notice of this, and only laid his hands lightly on my breast, and I felt very cold there for a while. 
Then he says, laughing more, give me your faith in women. And at that I started into my bed as though I'd been stung, for though I, for I thought of my sweet mother in England, and for a while I fa fancied that my faith in God's best creatures could neither be shaken nor stolen from me. But later, myself's hard eyes being upon me, I fell to thinking, for the second time that night, of Kitty, she that jilted me, and married Tom Sanderson, and of Miss Mistress Vanusen, whom only my devilish pride made me follow, and how she was even worse than Kitty, and I, worst of them all, seeing that my life's work to be done, I must needs go dancing down the devil's sweep and garnished causeway, because, forsooth, there was a light woman's smile at the end of it. And I thought that all women in the world were either like Kitty or Mistress Vansuthen, as indeed they have ever since been to me. And this put me to such extremity of rage and sorrow that I was beyond word glad when myself, myself's hand fell on my, again on my left breast, and I was no more troubled by these follies. After this he was silent for a little while, and I made sure that he must go or I awake ere long, but presently he speaks again, and very softly, that I was a fool to care for such follies as those he had taken from me, and that ere he went he would only ask me for a few other trifles, such as no man, or for matter of that boy either, would keep about him in this country. And so it happened that he took took out of my very heart, as it were, looking all the time into my face with his own, my own eyes, as much as remained to me of my boy's soul and conscience. This was to me far a far more terrible loss than the two that I had suffered before, for though, Lord help me, I had travelled far enough from all paths of decent or godly living, yet there was in me, though I myself write it, a certain goodness of heart which, when I was sober or sick, made me very sorry of all of that I had done before the fit came on me, and this I wholly lost, having in place thereof another deadly coldness at the heart. I am not, as I have before said, ready with my pen, so I fear that what I have just written may not be readily understood, yet there be certain times in a young man's life when, through great sorrow or sin, all the boy in him is burnt and seared away so that he passes at one step to the more sorrowful state of manhood, as our staring Indian day changes into night, with never so much as the grey twilight to temper the two extremes. This shall perhaps make my state more clear, if it is to be remembered that my torment was ten times as great as comes in natural course of nature to any man, at that time I dared not to think of the change that had come all over me, and all in one night, though I have often thought of it since. I have paid the price, says I, my teeth chattering, for I was deadly cold. And what is my return? At this time it was nearly dawn, and myself had begun to grow pale and thin against the white light in the east, as my mother used to tell me is the custom of ghosts and devils and the like. He made as if he would go, but my words stopped him. And he laughed, as I remembered that I laughed when I ran Angus McAllister through the sword arm last August, because he said that Mrs. Van Suthen was no better than she should be. What return? says he, catching up my last words. Why, strength to live as long as God or devil pleases, and so long as you live, my young master, my gift. With that, he put something into my hand, and though it was still too dark to see what it was, and when I next looked up, he was gone. When the light came, I made shift to behold his gift, and saw that it was a little piece of dry bread. That is the uh, dream of Darren Parthness by uh, Rudyard Kipling. And yeah. <laughs>